I want to thank you um, for giving me the opportunity um, to speak before you. This is the third time that I've testified um, on this issue. Um, and, and sometimes it feels like um, I'm not being heard. Um, I want to address a couple issues um, that were raised um, in previous testimony, um, what I feel are misconceptions. Um, first, involves the statute passed in 2012 and the public process which it went through and uh, the state stating that it went through a, a full transparent public process. When I first found out about the proposed, uh, the proposed statute, the proposed um, new law, um, I immediately contacted my representatives in the legislature. My representative, Kim Olson from Phippsburg, was the chair of the Marine Resources Committee. So not only her, but other representatives. I contacted multiple representatives before the first public hearing on this bill. And nobody could provide me the language of the statute. The only information I could be provided before that first public testimony was the, uh, the header. They said it was a holding header on it. And, um, you know, when we came and testified that first time, it was very apparent that the proponents of the law had spent a long time working on it and were quite knowledgeable of the details of the statute. Right there indicates to me as a citizen, you know, an unbalance and a lack of transparency. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to mention. Uh, a little bit about me. I moved back to Maine in 2005. I come from Bath originally. I live in Phippsburg now. Um, previous to returning to Maine, I spent my, my post-college career, 12 years, working for the Western Shoshone Native people in Nevada, primarily uh, analyzing and addressing the impacts of metallic hard rock mining on the lands and resources of the Western Shoshone people, both historic, current, and proposed mine projects. Nevada is the silver state. It has a 150 year, uh, over 150 year history of regulating mining. Um, you would hope they know what they're doing at this point. Now for the 12 years that I worked out there, uh, hard rock mining was regulated under both the state government and, and much of the activity was on federal lands, so there was a federal process through the Interior uh, Bureau of Land Management. Both the state regulatory agency and the Federal Bureau of Land Management would only permit zero discharge mines. Zero discharge. Not a little discharge to the groundwater, but zero discharge mines. And I think the crux of the problem we're facing here is we have a statute that was passed with what I feel inappropriate or not enough discussion and understanding of the implications of it. And the statute says, yeah, we can discharge to the groundwater. Um, I, I think that's very problematic. Now, I've visited um, huge mine sites, a lot bigger than perhaps what is proposed here in Maine. Uh, very well-financed mine sites, the biggest mining companies in the world, Newmont, Barrick, Homestake, Placerdome, um, with a high degree of regulation, a high degree of monitoring and precautions, and yet at these modern mine sites, we still have both groundwater and surface water contaminations. And remember, these are permitted as zero discharge mines. And so, and this is in the driest state in the nation. So based on my experience both in Nevada, but also in, in communicating and working with communities across the Americas, across the world really, I don't know of a, of a sulfitic metallic deposit that has been successfully developed without water contamination. Now I want to speak to the Eagle Mine that has been mentioned. Um, it was noteworthy that the state geologist did not answer the question regarding the native communities that you asked him. And the reason why it is my understanding that the tribes around 
the eagle mind have consistently opposed it. And for the very same reasons we hear the Maliseet people here, the, 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 the fundamental necessity to protect the water and the relationship of the tribes using the resources from their lands and that water that permeates it all. And so I would, I would recommend that, you know, if you really are interested in the eagle mind and not just the community, but communities that are impacted by it, then you speak to all of them, including the native communities. Because with the rebirth of mining across the Great Lakes, I happen to know that many of the tribes across the Great Lakes are incredibly concerned about the rebirth of metallic mining across the upper Great Lakes. Now, most mines, when they first begin, they work all right. I mean, they spend a lot of money. They want them to work right. So it's not surprising that the Eagle Mine is working all right. It's a new mine. It's only a few years old. Most problems, especially regarding water quality issues, especially regarding acid mine drainage and oxidation, these problems start later in the life of the mine or in the post-life of the mine. So I feel it's a little disingenuous to hold the Eagle Mine up as an example of a successful mine when this mine has just begun. It hasn't been closed. They just started operating. Now, I find it interesting because in my work in the 90s in Nevada, the mining industry came to the tribes in Nevada and said, we have a model mine. <laughs> we have a model mine to show you that we can develop sulfitic ore bodies underneath and around surface and groundwaters without contaminating it. And this happened in Wisconsin. And so um, I would strongly suggest you look at the history of the uh, mine in Wisconsin now my memory, perhaps not as good as it should be, might have been the Flambeau mine, uh, might have been Ladysmith, uh, might have been Crandon. I, when I submit some written comments, I will identify particularly the mine that was held up as a model mine. That mine has since been closed, and, and you don't hear it held up as a model mine because they have not been able to address water contaminant issues in the post-closure period. We know that there are volcanic sulfitic deposits in the highlands of Maine. We know we have pure water. We know from experience that it is very difficult, if not impossible, to protect water quality when you develop sulfitic ore bodies. So why would we allow the discharge of contaminants into groundwater? I grow oysters. Uh, my family has a lobster business, has a campground business. I grow oysters on Casco Bay. Casco Bay is a zero discharge zone. That means you can't put any contaminants, toxic or non-toxic, into the bay because it's recognized that even little Little bits of contamination, even non-toxic, put in by lots of people everywhere, has a long-term detrimental effect to the biological and ecological uh, capacity of the bay. Now, we know we need clean water. We know we have clean water. What we don't know, we don't know in the future what we're going to need that water for. We don't know who's going to need that water. We don't know what is going to need that water. But we do know we're going to need the water. The water is necessary. Clean water is necessary. Fresh water represents just a tiny fraction of the water on the planet. So why we would consider an industry that would seek to damage that water, contaminate that water, is really beyond me. And so, you know, as a descendant of a family that's, that's been here for 300 years, over 300 years, I like to think that it's instilled in me, you know, concern for the greater community of Maine. Well, you know, my work in Native communities have made me understand 
that we all have a responsibility for the water. We are all water. We have it not for ourselves, but again, like I said, we have it for the future generations and not just people. Fish, animals, everything, it all needs that water. And so you know, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave you at that, but I, I just think it is, it is absurd that, uh, that we think that we could grow our economy you know, in the long term by sacrificing the one thing that we know we have and we need. And so that's my statement. Thank you.